All right, so let's call the uh, the Executive Advisory Committee to order. Uh, let's see. So, uh, items 2 through 39 are items for possible action. Items 1 and 40 are for discussion. Mr. Mr. Vice Chair, we, we need to have a citizen's participation first, please. Okay. Sorry. Oh, no problem. Number one there. All right, so number one, uh, let's conduct a citizen's uh, comment period. No action can be taken on any matter discussed under this item, although the Executive Advisory Committee can direct that it be placed on a future agenda. Is there anyone wishing to speak under this item at this time? Seeing none, I will close the citizen's participation portion. Okay, so now I'll go back to items 2 through 39 are items for possible action. Items 1 and 40 are discussion items and no action can be taken. Um, so let's go to item 2 is approval of the agenda. I believe staff has a uh, change. Yes, we do have a change, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we would like to pull number four off the consent agenda. Um, we uh, found a error thanks to the vigilance of uh, our friends at the City of Las Vegas. So the handout that you have uh, received uh, corrects that error. It was essentially um, in the motor vehicle fuel tax section in Exhibit A, the very last item, um, 185A Horse Drive closeout. Uh, 40,000 going back in the pot. Uh, that was incorrectly identified as the city of North Las Vegas. Um, it is correctly identified in your handout as the city of Las Vegas. Okay. So with that, can I have a motion to approve the um, agenda with that slight change to move item four off of consent? So moved. Okay. So then item three were well, items 3 through 39, with the exception of item 4, are on the consent agenda. And uh, Mr. Vice Chair, we need to vote to, on the agenda. Yeah, we need to vote on the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so we have a motion. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, so that motion carries. Uh, okay, so then the consent agenda, items 3 through 39, with the exception of item 4, uh, which has been moved off to address the correction. Uh, are on the consent agenda. Anyone have any issues with those? So can we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. So moved. We have a motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we go back to item four. And I think staff kind of gave an update, but staff? Uh, yes, that uh, we just wanted to correct the item. Uh, this is uh, the first time that we've gone to a new format. Uh, I'm sure that was not lost on the committee. Uh, Again, in the spirit of um, simplification, um, red tape reduction, um, we have consolidated all the moves that are associated with the capital plan uh, into one item and there'll be a spreadsheet. Uh, what we're going to do in the future is have a cross-reference on this uh, from the Exhibit A to the agenda item in the packet. So it'll be very easy for Boulder City to say, okay, 135 AA. Um, that's an original uh, action to change the capital plan. Uh, then that will say, uh, I think it's item 10 maybe. Anyway, so you'll be able to quickly go to it. There'll be another column uh, that we would want to put, to do the same thing for the board probably. So there'll be two uh, numbers just to cross-reference, make it easier to, to work with. So um, that is the change. So uh, staff would recommend approval. All right. So we have um, any questions on that item? All right, can we have a motion to approve item four? Uh, move to follow staff recommendations for item number four. All right, so we have a motion to approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, and so that quickly moves us to item 40, which is to conduct our second public comment period, I believe. So uh, no action can be taken on any matter discussed under this item, although the EAC may direct that it be put on a future agenda. Is there anyone wishing to speak under this portion of the agenda? Seeing none, I'll adjourn the meeting. All right. I guess. Quick, simple, fast, and in a hurry. Thanks, everyone, for coming out for that five minutes. <laughs> and uh, they're in the working group meeting. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, right, Raymond? Yes, see you, Mike. See you And then uh, we're also going to have uh, uh, Mike write up a question, so we'll have a couple minutes to discuss that as far as 
Albert handling the CIPs now, and I also have uh, something to show you that is very exciting on the work zone ITS front. So stay tuned for that. That Raymond, take it away. Yep. All right. Fred, did you say it's just going to be on CMAX stuff? Or? We have CMAX and yes, something on CIP oh, like as well. So if you want to wait for that, I think you want to wait for the CIP. So, yeah, great. Okay. Whoa, well played. <laughs> it could have been bad. The new one is totally different now. It's different in a good way. It's because it's going from 468 to 565. But these ones had a big drop. And so I asked them to do it. It's going to be a big drop. I like to leave. And I guess we adjourn <laughs> the meeting. <laughs> waiting for somebody. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and all over the Unless somebody tells me not to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think we're done. <laughs> no, I had sent it to him just to say, hey, heads up. No, I can say, what? Oh. Mm -hmm. Let's start. Okay, so uh, before we get into kind of the CMAC discussion and some of the, uh, the other things, I wanted to just, uh, Sandra and I have been talking about the uh, interlocal contract. You may recall we presented this at the last Executive Advisory Committee. Um, it was held, well, one of the re recommendations was that NDOT be a signatory to that. Um, so NDOT has been looking it over um, and, I, you know, not to speak for Sandra, I, I think the impression right now is that there probably isn't too much heartburn about being a signatory to it. Um, and that kind of shares uh, something that I shared with you all, which is we have existing contracts that ex um, define a lot of these roles and responsibilities between NDOT and the MPO, um, both in the Unified Planning Work Program and a bunch of other things, including federal regs. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's just one of those situations that if this group feels very strongly about getting NDOT to be a signatory to that contract. Um, I think, again, correct me if I'm wrong, Sandra, but NDOT would be willing to do it. Um, but just keep in mind that that will just add some time to the process because then their legal is going to have to review it because um, they're new to this contract uh, where in the past, you know, all the other entities have been signatories to it. Um, did I miss anything? You want to add any additional thoughts to that? I don't think so. I think, I think you described that well. Again, there's no, you know, there's nothing in there that I saw that has some of the we might want to tweak a, the wording of a couple things, but, you know, we're not sure it's absolutely necessary, but if it's helpful, we'll, uh, we'll take it through our process. Does anyone object to have an end that on it? If you guys are all in agreement, if they're in agreement, we might as well move forward with it. Yeah, I think, I think so. Uh, is the agreement been modified since we last spoke about it? I mean, because we had obligations in there for NDOT to perform. Mm -hmm. Right, so I, I think NDOT's legal hasn't actually gone through with a fine tooth comb yet, so I haven't gotten any suggested changes from NDOT yet, but it sounds like some minor language tweaks might be forthcoming, and we would obviously bring those back to you. If there's anything major, we'll sh share, I mean, we'll, we'll share it ahead of time to the extent possible anyway. Um, but if there's anything particularly problematic or, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that we kind of gauge the temperature of the room before we you know, bring it back to EAC. Do you have an idea of a timeline? Um, I do not. I haven't had a chance to look at it in great detail. I kind of skimmed it and like I said, I didn't see any big concerns. Mm -hmm. um, it sort of depends on legal's workload at the time, but it's usually a pretty quick 
turn around. Pause for laughter, legal. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends on if they see something in there well, that's, that's problematic. problematic. But if it's uh, really, again, a lot of it is is sort of reiterating federal regs or you know rules we already um, kind of perform. So, uh, given that there's no real, you know, there's no real commitment of money in there, it usually tends to go a little quicker if they're legal. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so I don't I don't want to guess on a timeline yet until I um, talk to them and then I can let Raymond know what we're what we're looking at. Okay. Um, we'll it's give not, you. It's unlikely to be you know months and months. It might be a few, a few weeks or a month. At a minimum, we'll give you an update at the next either EAC meeting or EAC working group meeting, and then uh, best case scenarios we'll actually have you know the latest draft that we can take to you for approval. Um, worst case scenario, we'll just give you an update. All right, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing, do we want to <coughs> touch on the ozone thing first before we get into the cement discussion? I think the ozone thing will go a little quicker. Sure. So there's, and, and I'm going to butcher this just because I was telling Craig earlier that it makes my brain hurt, um, this, this ozone determination. So there is a federal court ruling um, that rescinded the 2008 standard? No? Rescinded the 2015 rule. Rescinded the 2015 rule. Parts of the 2015, Parts of the 2015 <laughs> rule, which then mean that the which standard kicks in? The, the 2008 standard, 2008 rule that, that requires us to meet 1997. <laughs> <laughs> All right. huh? You guys do what you're talking about? Do the FedEx? <laughs> That's the fun part. Uh, I don't think anybody knows. You want to go long story short? Yeah, long story short. We're not trying to alarm anyone or anything. It's just prudent to bring this up so, so that everyone knows this is, this is out there. But to, to try to summarize all of this legal mumbo jumbo, at some point in the next couple of weeks, um, EPA will need a, so there's a deadline, I think, for EPA to submit a, a request to the court to rehear this case, essentially. Um, the, the effect on us, if that standing were to hold, is we would be what, what they're referring to as an orphan um, nonconformity, uh, which means we meet the new air quality standard, but not the old air quality standard. And there's a, a number of questions about the, the implications for that, but it could, it, it could potentially um, force us to demonstrate conformity to the 1997 standard, um, which at the moment our modeling indicates we, we wouldn't meet for one of the criteria. Um, and there's a number of technical reasons for that, but it's, it's just something to, to be aware of. There's really nothing we can do at the moment other than just to inform. Um, and as you can tell, it's confusing for us to understand exactly what's going on as well. But um, it's out there. It's uh, happening. Hopefully, we'll we should actually know what at least what the the next step in the process is going to be. We should know that by the the April EAC uh, working group. Soon we'll be working. Group. We should be able to let you know more at that point. And this is on the national radar. Ampo and Ashto, I think, took a joint stance on it, and others. Um, you know asking for a stay, asking for a bunch of different things uh, in terms of how um, this would take effect. So we don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but I guess worst case scenario, there is a situation or there is a scenario in, case in which we would not be able to demonstrate conformity. And so um, that would kind of send us into a little bit of a you know, brave new world for us to figure out how we're going to process uh, amendments um, and what effect that will have on our project list. So. So stay tuned. We'll keep you informed as this develops. Um, it's just one of those things that, you know, it, it's just kind of a quirky court ruling that set everything back. And so trying to figure out how it affects each MPO, especially those that can't demonstrate conformity anymore, um, is to be determined. What's the mitigation measure for that thing that we're failing on um, under this ruling? What's the type of mitigation that typically would address it? Yeah, so one of the things that, you know, we might need to get a little bit more strategic about is um, looking at our emission reduction calculations as, as it relates to the CMAC program in particular, um, which 
pollutants does it apply to? Is it uh, NOx. Yeah. NOx. NOx is the one that currently, you know, this this is all part. of This has to do with the, the way in which um, our emissions budgets are set, the modeling tools that we have to use. Um, the budget was set using an older modeling tool. You may have removed six, I think. Mobile six. Uh, mobile six. Mobile six. Yeah, mobile six. Um, and the new uh, now we have to use moves. Um, as the modern tool. Moves tends to show higher emissions, even though it's been refined over, over years, the, it's sort of been converging with what, what Mobile 6 used to show. Um, but anyways, it's NOx. It's one of the precursors for ozone um, that, that it shows it's being over budget for right now. <coughs> Using the new modeling tool, our our use of the new modeling tool compared to the budget that was set using the old one. But it is what it is. Okay. Um, and it's a long process to set a new budget. Um, so a number of challenges come after that. For those of you who don't know me, Greg Novak, Federal Highways, it's a 31-page legal opinion. <laughs> that like reading through does not help. <laughs> <laughs> Nationally, we've been asked uh, where where all the MPOs stand, and you know when you're going to have plan updates or, or tip amendments, and it's in the next three to six months or nine months. So yeah, it's on the national radar. South Coast Air Quality District, LA, Sierra Club, all our usual contacts, EPA. So you guys are on top of it as best you can be. You said what nine months? Well, we were looking at. MPO actions over the next few months. What would what would trigger some of this stuff? What yeah, cycle you're in? When we, uh, we'll have an RTP RTP done, done by then, right? I'm assuming we'll have one. Yeah, I mean okay. that's the current plan to be done by the end of the year, so we should be okay. But uh, it may require some, you know, additional yeah. Yeah. paperwork yeah. or modeling or whatever the case may be. So it transitions kind of that kind of transition to the nice thing. Next, the next quick discussion. Just wanted to give an update on the timeline for the regional transportation plan revision. Um, so basically, what we're looking at the, the handout that I that I sent around um, is it, sort of the key local agency dates. Obviously, there's a whole bunch of other internal stuff, and things you're going to have to do with NDOT and, and some other stuff. But um, uh, basically, what we're on. What we show right now is a timeline that gets us to adoption at the October RTC board uh, meeting, and then we sort of back plan everything uh, from there. The couple things to note, uh, because it's been so long since we did the call for projects, uh, almost almost a year now, we're going to give a little bit of an opportunity, a few weeks at least, for everyone to look over your projects, um, see if there are any changes you want to make, Changes in description, scope, whatever. If there's something new, be an opportunity to, you know, give us a little bit of information about it, and then, and then, give us enough information so that we can proceed with the project um, identification and selection process, and then we'll we'll get the, the detailed information that we that we got in those two-page um, spreadsheet forms. For so, just I mean, one I'll mention that I know is hopefully coming is or, um, talked about is the city and the county. I'm working on the um, Spencer Greenway um, project, which I think is in discussion, but I, I haven't actually gotten the form yet for that. Um, so anyway, I'll send out I'll send that out early next week. Um, provide about 10 days or so for for turnaround on that. Um, we are trying to merge this process a little bit with the CIP. Um, which I understand the deadline for that is you're getting all your numbers <coughs> to uh, streets and highways by the 16th of April, because um, then we have to go through those lists and identify what are the new region significant projects. Um, then we're going to have, and this is this is new, uh, but it's, we're going to have an initial public comment period. We're going to basically we're going to throw the projects and their descriptions up on a map, put it out there for the public to comment on projects early in the process rather than at the end of the process. Uh, and it's not going to really affect what we do other than it will let us share, you know, we want to turn around and share all of the feedback that we receive.
team um, with everyone who's um, submitted to get the project. Um, but it, it, you know, it will strengthen our public engagement process uh, and the transparency that we're trying to apply uh, to the RCD. Um, and uh, uh, like I said, it, it will give you potentially more information about any feedback on the projects that you know, your jurisdictions that that you requested or proposed. Um, then after that, we'll, we'll put together a draft project list uh, in early, the, well, I'm aiming for May 10th, uh, and then we'll meet individually with all the local agencies to discuss projects and confirm anything, and then we'll do a group meeting to sort of get a, an informal validation before we you know, formally bring that back. Um, but we'll have the final project list that Beth and her team will use for modeling. Uh, we'll have that at the end of May. And then two, you know, basically two and a half, three months of modeling and any plan development or uh, plan rewriting components like that. Um, and then uh, public hearing or public comment process that starts um, in late August. Uh, we're only required to do a 21-day public comment process. I've bumped that up to four weeks. Um, a little bit of extra time, buffer time, basically, if we need it. Uh, we'll have a public comment process during the EAC meeting. Um, and then we'll take it back to, we'll bring it back to the EAC for your recommendation on the 27th of September and then take it to the board if there are still meetings. One other little note, the, the individual meetings happening May 14th through the 17th, I think the idea, correct me if I'm wrong, Craig, is to meet with both planning and public works together. So when we try to schedule those, um, we're, we'll try to find a spot where um, both departments can be represented in those discussions, just to kind of bring them more into the fold in this process. One thing also that I'm going to mention is um, when I send out the project list on April 3rd, and that's not the selected project list, that's just a reformatted version of what you guys have already sent us for your requested projects. Uh, when I send that, I'm also going to include um, your currently programmed CMAC projects because we've had this, this discussion about um, taking, uh, taking CMAC projects that, that frankly have been difficult to get obligated and trying to fund the PE uh, Design right of way with local funds, and then when the project is actually right, then we take it and put it into the tip for, um, for CMAC funding at that point, so that we're not doing constant amendments and, and revisions to um, to the tip. So I'm gonna we're not you know we're not trying to force your hand on that or anything, but I do want to try to make it as easy as possible for that to happen, um, so that the projects. So we hopefully try to clean up our, our you know, tip and RTP process. I remember our, our goal, based on how how frequently we, we end up having to slip uh, CMAC projects in particular, our goal is to try to you know reduce the total number of CMAC projects, bump up, you know, have a few larger CMAC projects um, that you know that serve the region, um, and then with funds to become available. With, with the funds that aren't, you know, programmed for those larger projects, try to find projects from the CIP that are ready to move that then we can um, shift over and find if they're, you know, if they're eligible CMAC projects at that time. So that would technically be, you know, how we would be looking at that. Um, so I just wanted to, to put that out there and give you the opportunity to do that um, without, you know, without trying to force your hands. Questions on that? Okay. Yes. Can I ask one? Since I'm wearing the planner hat and I approve the East Step stuff now, where do NDOT's projects come into this mix? I mean, it looks like there's parallel paths, but you guys can combine some projects. Yeah, so How does that really I'm work? I'm going to make a similar version of this for NDOT, but they're, they'll basically be on the same timeline, okay. except because we don't, you know, we don't have a project selection or review or process. With in that project, other than we want to be able to categorize them in the same way that we can categorize ours. Um, 
and now we'll, you know, we'll have we'll have their final project list identified at the end of May as well, even though frankly I think it's pretty close right now. Um, and that'll and that'll then also feed into the model. Okay. Thanks. Now one one thing to also just mention is more of a back end kind of thing, but we're trying we're working with NDOT on um, making some revisions to ESTIF so that it can finally meet the functionality that, that we always talked about using in, in the RCP process as well. And so at some point after that final project was done in May, it'll be about a month or so, we're, we're going to ask everyone to enter the projects into ESTIF uh, as well. Because we'll use that, uh, we think we've got everything sort of timed out so that we'll be able to use ESTIF to generate the reports, um, the, you know, the project lists in the same format that we currently share them in and tip, uh, tip them in. It's kind of, you know, back end kind of stuff, but um, it, it should clean up the process a fair amount. And, and, and the next cycle down the road, that'll be basically how you request new projects, is you go to ESTIF and you enter the project in as, a, as, as an amendment. Um, and then, you know, based on what actions you take, uh, and these that's how far they can get into the RCP or the tip. Well, to make it easier to advance projects and things like that. It's also really helpful just from a public understanding perspective because that format is searchable and online and more and more, you know, people are getting confused in it. So it'd be nice to not have to say, well, for the SIP projects you go there, but for the RCP projects, you know, go to all these from, you know, four different places, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. So okay. guys, what I was going to ask you guys, do you have any problem with this approach, trying to do the PE and design and right away with local funds and then concentrate on construction only with the CMI? Do you guys have any issues? I think it doesn't preclude them from still buying the street sweepers and all the things they want to do, right? No, okay. no, it doesn't, it doesn't preclude that. There could still be there could still be projects like that, um, but the project because they, they don't get held up as, as, as readily as the ones that, you know, that actually get into like right away issues. Um, so yeah, it doesn't, doesn't interfere with that at all. I mean, we just have to we'll have to you know do the programming appropriately and sort of think ahead and plan ahead and stuff and track track really carefully where we are um, with obligations um, so that you know we're actually. We're actually programming and spending, programming and obligating uh, the funds that the CMAX funds that, that come to us every year, right? and not carrying over huge amounts. The, the P and E would that be considered the match, or would there be a match again on top of the construction? Well, because it's local. Oh, actually, um, you would need to match the construction. You still have to match. The so it would be five percent. The match plus the P and E investment for CMAX. Correct. Right. Yeah. Right. Will we still be able to pay um, construction labor out of the construction funds? Uh, sure. I think so. If it's yeah. construction related, like construction management and stuff like that? Yeah, it wouldn't, yeah. Nothing would change anything sure. as far as, you know, like, it wouldn't change what's eligible, it would just, you know, it's clean up the process. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
uh, more effectively obligate CMAC funding, I think is in all of our best interests. You know, we, we are uh, forever uh, worried about a, a rescission. Uh, the last one came down pretty quickly and didn't give us a chance to, to uh, react. And so, you know, I think the, the better, the, the tighter the program is, the better off we'll be. Um, this is one strategy that was just discussed, this idea that, you know, if you get projects, for lack of a better term, shovel-ready, I know we don't like that term anymore, but if we get them shovel-ready and then put them in the CMAC program, then we can obligate a little bit more seamlessly. Um, but the other thing that we've discussed for a long time is, you know, are there big projects out there? And so we want to continue to have this discussion about, is there a, a, a major project that we can put in the, the, the CMAC program that we know will obligate on an on an ongoing basis, um, and so we want to just kind of open it up to you all for you know continued consideration on that as we develop the project list that go into the RTP because you know obviously now is the time for us to program those and have that discussion about programming those so that um, it, it's suited the way it needs to be or it's identified the way it needs to be in the RTP. But so Greg, you had a strategy where you were going to program seven amounts every year for the next 20 years of doing the plan. So, yeah, I mean, because most CMAC projects are um, are exempt from air quality, uh, what we might, what we're looking at is, um, you know, basically for the balances that aren't assigned to larger projects. Like, let's say we find a big, um, big ITS project that's going to take many millions of dollars over multiple years, that one may occupy, that would be listed as some separate project. But um, for the other projects, we might follow, we might try to follow the strategy similar to what we did for the RCP last time around, which is, you know, we knew there's this, um, we, we know essentially what the forecast is for what we're going to receive in CMAP, and we assigned it to budget, or to budget. So we basically, you know, we set up a congestion management bucket, an air quality bucket, um, safety bucket, things like that. So what we will probably try to do is to just sort of set aside a balance of CMAP that, you know, we're trying to time this out right, but basically so that there is money available for um, the project as they get through the locally funded PE right away process, that there's still, you know, um, Money available in the tip that hasn't been, you know, occupied or, or spoken for uh, with one of the other large projects that we're hopefully going to identify soon and be able to. <coughs> so even though you want the local entity to get those projects ready with local funds, you still want to in, want in the tip probably in the next year so that in the information one year right. you're assured that your money is eventually going to lead to a federally funded project, but also so you have. Budget kind of allocated for, um, right. Makes sense. One of the things we talked about is um, it's going to have a <coughs> bucket in there because in the past what has been happening is when you can transfer the money, we flex it to transit. So we're sort of doing this back and forth. It's going to have a line item in there as well for high capacity transit, which means that if you know if you guys have any projects, the IT or any improvements, transit like Maryland Park, for example and it's ready for prime time, that would be elected to move forward uh, as part of this process as well. Okay. All right. Anything else? I, as long as I'm here, CMAC is state money, and so how does NDOT compete for those projects? And you have the option for advanced construction conversion mm -hmm. for projects that have been that would qualify, such as anything that says HOV on it. Yeah, and Greg, we, we've talked about this a lot of times. NDOT is invited to the same call for projects as anyone else. We, we know it's NDOT money, um, and NDOT's quick to remind us of that. Um, so they're, they're welcome to, as a matter of fact, we just put five, five million on the HOV direct connect ramps at Hacienda and Harmon. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's part of the process, so. That would be nice, though, if we end up take all the CMAC and give us the gas tax. Not going to happen. <laughs> Just ask me. I heard that. No, I'm still not going to ask that. It doesn't hurt to ask, but it's not going to happen.
In Fred's defense, there was a similar <laughs> ask for the RTC, right? <laughs> sure. He's just yeah. deflecting. <laughs> yeah, no, we're not going to take the most difficult money to spend and give you the easiest. Well, you don't have to be your own LPA for you to see my Right? Leave everybody some time. All right. One, one just quick final note, um, not really all, all that, but we just wanted to just let everyone know um, that we're not planning to do a call for projects for UPWP this, this cycle. And the reason for that is um, we've got projects still to kick off um, from, uh, from the last cycle. We're trying some new approaches um, with the idea of having projects that the local agencies actually you know, own or, or, or manage. Um, and that, that's just taking a little bit of, a little bit of time. Um, uh, we're going to do the second <coughs> pilot of the local center studies um, project. Um, so that's going to be a new one. I mean, it'll be listed as a new project in the UWG. Um, and then uh, we're having some discussions about uh, uh, a study looking at some longer term transportation issues relating to the stadium that regional in nature. It's actually a proposal that came out of the local center studies from the county. Uh, and um, so we're, we're looking at, you know, how to maybe scope something, scope something that's appropriate for that that sort of takes, you know, the track impact analysis that is coming um, that looks beyond um, to the, the longer term type issue with, uh, around the state. Um, and then uh, I think there's some staff have doubt that there's um, potentially some modeling, some internal things, and some things we're required to do that, you know, just sort of keep up to date on, on what we do with NPO. Um, the other part of that, though, is that uh, we're going to look at starting the UPWD call for projects cycle earlier next year. So we may actually initiate that as early as October or November. <coughs> Um, to, to get the UPWP project identified and moving forward um, for, you know, for adoption next year uh, in sort of the way that we've done in the past. But start that process earlier um, and try to program projects on a two-year cycle instead of on a one-year cycle. Well, that's the, that's the, the trend. Uh, other NPOs in the state are doing that. Other NPOs across the country are doing that. It, tends to be uh, a bit easier process once it goes into play. And we're just on a similar <coughs> topic. We're now just starting to talk about our SPR, which is the statewide plan research program that NDOT has. Mm -hmm. We're getting better about you know, coordinating with RTC in terms of what planning studies we're both working on and where we can share funds or where we can kind of trade off those. So um, we look forward to continuing that. Right. Okay. We'll do both. Yeah, I mean, we we both have <coughs> planning money, and we've been having more discussions about which studies or efforts make more sense for the RTC as a lead versus that not the lead. And um, we're now cross-referencing, I think, in both documents where there's other related studies that are going on. Jeff, you ready? Sure. All right. It would be nice if that was coming up, but I can work around that. <coughs> um, so yeah, it's uh, this is the most exciting thing in the history of the world. Just to start slow, all right? And we're going to build up to a crescendo. I'm just going to start right from the crescendo and say this is the greatest thing for a traffic guy. <laughs> okay, how for a traffic guy is the greatest thing in the history of the world. Is that better? All right, uh, we have been working with, oh, this is not a text screen, there we go. Um, we have been uh, working with uh, an ITS company, works on an ITS company called ICOM. Uh, we have a partnership with Waze, and we've had it for a while now. Uh, we've been working with a traffic control company uh, called uh, Triton Traffic Technologies, and we've been working with our wonderful friends at the city of Henderson to deploy a uh, work zone ITS solution that, uh, again, is the 
greatest thing in the history of the world when it comes to traffic control. What we are, this is really a version of a vehicle um, or infrastructure to vehicle communication. Um, what we have is arrow boards. As everybody knows, you see the arrow boards all over the place. The, the one rule that uh, the, the barricade companies and the agencies uh, enforce and adhere to is that if you take a lane in this valley, you have got to put up an arrow board. Uh, so that is really the key to determining where those lane closures are. Right now, um, we can show, and we do show uh, in a, on our cone management working group, on our seeing orange site, where all the construction zones or construction projects are. The limitation is that we're not able to show where the construction zones, the work zones are within that big project. This is the bridge to get us to that point. Um, what, now you can see there's a construction zone here. Uh, this was uh, reported by two Wazers. You know, Wazers is a crowdsourced uh, navigation app. It tells us where all the cool stuff is out there. Uh, police, construction zones, all kinds of stuff. Uh, what we have done is we now have the ability. Oh, come on, guy. This is the most amazing thing right here. <laughs> you can see this is not reported by a person. This is reported by iPhone. It is being reported by a piece of traffic control equipment, i.e., the arrow board directly well, to the ICON servers, and then ICON sends it to Waze. Waze puts it on the map. Um, we are in conversations with the city of uh, Las Vegas and the city of North Las Vegas. We're looking at putting these on the Ogden project, possibly, Mike, um, working with uh, Tom and uh, Corey. And we're, uh, the, the North Las Vegas has the Sawtooth Infill project out on Gowan, I believe. Um, so we're looking at that one. Uh, it's transparent. The beautiful thing about this is it's completely transparent from the person setting up the arrow board. He flips it on, he puts it in right arrow mode or left arrow mode, uh, right lane closed, and it's 